Well, I'm welcome. Today we're going to do three things. First, look at the idea of an event, uh, one of the most basic constructs in relativity, in fact, in physics. We'll then look at the famous Lorentz transformations, a key uh, result from special relativity. Lastly, we'll begin to investigate some properties of the Lorentz transformations. We won't get all the way through section 10. I want to begin with the event. An event is just this. It's a click. Something that happens at a particular point in space, at a particular instant of time, according to some observer. So you'll have some observer with a particular reference frame, a particular x, y, z, t. We restrict ourselves to inertial reference frames, non-accelerating frames. And an event is quick. It's how we coordinateize uh, space-time. Space-time is four-dimensional space. Coordinates, clicks, uh, events are uh, points in space-time. Uh, the coordinates of an event uh, are going to be observer-dependent. Uh, different frames of reference will, in general, assign different uh, position and time coordinates to an event. But this is a way that we describe or coordinateize uh, the space-time upon which uh, particles and fields uh, live, exist, evolve, and interact. It's a shorter section in the course. Uh, let's move to <laughs> the <Lorentz> transformations. <laughs> um, the Einstein um, law of light propagation, in essence, says there is no privileged frame of reference. Oh. Uh, there's no preferred frame of reference. So this click, you know, when I do this, that's a geometric thing. It exists independently of whether you stick your fingers here or stick your fingers there. Right? That's a geometric object, a click, a dot, a point in space-time. The most, um, as I said, the most fundamental object in physics, really. Um, now, we could choose to coordinateize that object with a particular frame of reference, a particular inertial frame of reference. Uh, let's call it S. And according to S, that dot, that geometric point that exists in space-time, independently of how we choose to coordinateize it, um, according to some inertial observer S, those would be the four coordinates of this event, of this space-time point, of this uh, dot in space-time. Now we're going to restrict ourselves to inertial coordinate frames. Now we ask the question, suppose you had some other frame of reference, x prime, y prime, z prime, and t prime. Well, according to that frame of reference, um, there's going to be different space-time coordinates for that point. And since there's no absolute frame of reference, relativity is intimately concerned not with what things are in terms of absolute sense, although there are absolutes, we'll get to those, but rather how to transform from um, one description of nature according to one non-privileged frame to a different non-privileged frame. So question, we're going to be intimately concerned with how to transform uh, descriptions of the physical world such as dots, points in space-time. How do you transform from a description of that dot or that particle or that field or that momentum, whatever, from one inertial frame to another? And the Lorentz transformations are going to tell us how to transform events. Now, ultimately, we want to transform events. We want to be able to transform positions and times. We want to be able to transform velocities and accelerations and lengths and electric fields and magnetic fields and momenta. Uh, in fact, all of the quantities of physics we're going to want to ultimately be able to transform from one frame to another. But to begin with, we need to be able to um, uh, transform the event. And the business of the Lorentz transformation is to uh, develop a transformation formula for events um, uh, as described with, within two different inertial frames uh, in a way that respects Einstein's axioms. But before I go on, I want to introduce the most boring term in the course, which is when we speak of uh, two inertial reference frames as being in standard configuration, uh, as being in standard configuration with respect to each other. So this is referring to a pair of inertial reference frames in a standard configuration. So we're going to have one inertial reference frame, and the, which we're going to call S. And this is going to have an x-axis, a y-axis, a z-axis, and a time. Right? So um, there's going to be an x, y, z, t. So if you were to have some event, S would say 
the space-time coordinates are x, y, z, t. Now when we speak of two inertial reference frames in static configuration, I want to introduce our second frame. But I want to uh, introduce not just an arbitrary inertial second frame, but a, um, a, a so-called static configuration. I want its x prime axis to be parallel to the x-axis. It's going to have a different time in general. Yep. So according to S prime, that same event. And the fact that the times are different might be something as simple as um, you just set your watch differently, right? Um, now the plasticity of time is much more profound than that in special relativity, but the point is the times will in general be different. Even Newton would be happy with this. I want this um, second frame S prime to be moving relative to S uh, at a speed at a vo with vo velocity V in the positive X prime direction. Now, uh, I also want, so I want uh, several things to be true. There's three things that need to be true for a pair of inertial reference frames to be in standard configuration. So this is meant to be one horizontal straight line. Point number one. Uh, at time t equals t prime equals naught, every axis must coincide. So when t equals t prime equals naught, these two points here will be overlapping. How do you know that t equals t prime equals naught? Because a wristwatch attached to each of these. This wristwatch, or every wristwatch in the lattice of points will be clicking t's. Every wristwatch here is clicking t primes. At t equals t prime equals naught, these two wristwatches um, overlap in space. They can compare the times and they'll be the same. So at t equals t prime equals naught, uh, all axes coincide, including the origin. Second point, uh, the direction of motion of this one relative to this is going to be along the x uh, equals x prime direction. And the third point is that this frame is moving relative to this one uh, um, with a velocity v in the x equals x prime direction. Now, one can work with more um, uh, arbitrary pairs of inertial frames. Uh, it makes the formulas a lot harder. Um, but you don't get, um, you get very, very little extra physics out of it. So we're going to work with uh, reference frames in standard configuration with respect to each other. By the way, we could say that this one, there's no absolute frame of rest, right? You need to get rid of the idea of absolutes. I could say that this one um, is moving to the right relative to S. You know, if I could just draw a little cartoon, I could say that S prime is moving to the right relative to S. But I'm not going to say that S is stationary. I mean, S is stationary in S's frame. But the point is, equivalently, I could say there's no difference. There's no absolute frame of rest. I could also say that S is moving to the left relative to S prime. There is no absolute frame of rest. These things are absolutely equivalent. Here, I've chosen to draw S at rest and S moving this way relative to S, S prime moving this way relative to S. But one could also have the converse picture. And the idea of the relativity principle is there is no absolute frame of rest. There is no ether um, with respect to which, there is no stationary ether with respect to which a frame could be stationary. Uh, both of these are absolutely equivalent. I'll actually return to that point later in this class. Here we have our pair of uh, inertial frames in standard configuration with respect to one another. And again, that term will be used a hundred times or so uh, during this course, standard configuration. Now we ask the question, let's um, invoke the theory of relativity, but Galileo's theory of relativity, and we can ask the question, um, you know, Galileo said that the laws of mechanics are the same in all inertial frames, so suppose we're doing um, mechanics, we're um, back in Galileo's time, we ask the question, how do you transform from one um, description of, a, of an event uh, to the other, or conversely? And so what you would have would be the so-called Galilean transformations, which are respected by Newtonian mechanics. T prime equals T. You know, don't worry about changing the origin of your watches. Remember what um, Newton said, absolute true and mathematical time uh, of itself and by its own nature flows uniformly on uh, dot, dot, dot. T prime equals T, of course it does. That's the time, according to Galileo. Galileo. Y prime equals Y and Z prime equals Z because of the way we've set up these uh, f inertial frames in standard configuration. X prime, on the other hand, 
as you know from more elementary studies, would be x minus vt. Again, um, if I say that this quantifies pre-relativistic quantum um, common sense, I'm actually um, being very imprecise there because this obeys a relativity principle, uh, the idea that the laws of mechanics are the same in all inertial frames. And so this is a different uh, form of relativistic common sense, uh, but, but which predates Einstein. Now, we could go ahead and differentiate these things with respect to time. And since t prime equals t, we could differentiate with respect to t uh, equals t prime. And what you would get, well, the first equation will give 1 equals 1. I won't even write that down. The second equation will give uh, dx prime dt equals uh, dx dt minus v. Uh, and we could rearrange this into the usual formula, uh, the Newtonian formula for relative velocities. Just stick this v on the other side and you get uh, dx dt um, equals um, dx prime dt plus v. If something is moving at a speed dx prime dt relative to this frame and the whole frame is moving at a speed v, add those two velocities velocities more precisely and you'll get the speed or the velocity of the particle in the S-frame. Uh, dy prime d, dt equals dy dt. Okay, these formulas are boring. So this is our um, velocity addition formula. But this is where things start to screw up. So this says, you know, what you learn from Newtonian mechanics, that if you're on an elevator moving at speed v relative to the ground and you throw a tennis ball with speed dx prime dt relative to the elevator, you just add v to get the speed relative to the ground. But uh, suppose you shine a light beam, right? Suppose you shine a light beam. Suppose that dx prime dt equals c. This will say that the speed of light relative to uh, S, if you have a, a light beam shone by someone who's stationary relative to S prime, light's traveling at speed C in the X prime direction, this would say that the speed of light according to S is C plus V, which violates um, the idea that the speed of light is the same in all inertial frames in all directions. Again, this is an elevation to the status of an axiom of the null result of the Michelson-Morley experiment. So this thing is in contradiction to um, the fact that um, uh, light travels at the same velocity in all directions, in all inertial frames, which is in essence what the null result of the Marcus and Morley experiment discovered. Therefore, um, if you start talking about light beams, these equations are broken down. They're not wrong. They have a domain of validity as to all physical theories. But these equations, the Galil Galilean transformations, uh, have broken down. Question, what do you replace the Galilean transformations with um, uh, in order to, A, respect the Einstein law of light propagation? And whatever the, those new transformations are, and they're going to be the Lorentz transformations, they must reduce to this in the domain of validity of Newtonian mechanics. All right, so let's do this. And we're going to derive uh, the Lorentz transformations. And this derivation is one of the derivations that Einstein gave. Um, it has the virtue of using nothing more difficult than um, uh, um, upper high school mathematical physics. But there are much, much cleaner and much more elegant derivations of the Lorentz transformations. But I'm going to give you this one because it's, um, I like the idea of using um, very, very elementary mathematics to profoundly change the world of theoretical physics. Uh, I also like the fact that Einstein did this calculation and certain aspects of Einstein's character, I would argue, come through this calculation. So we want to restrict ourselves to one transverse dimension, uh, x or x prime, yep. for simplicity. And we're going to consider, um, this is x, if it's not primed, it's s, right? This is going to be a little bullet of light traveling in the x direction. And that same bullet of light, these are meant to be overlapping axes. Um, according to s, it's the x axis. According to s prime, it's the x prime axis. But we have bullet of light moving to the right, uh, starting at the origin uh, at t equals naught. Fair enough. What is this bullet of light will have a coordinate 
that S says is x comma t, um, and x will be a function of t, and x will equal ct, distance equals speed times time, in other words, x minus ct equals naught, according to S. S prime will say something similar, x prime minus ct prime equals naught. Notice the speeds are the same, that's Einstein's law of light propagation uh, in action. So naught equals a constant times naught, from which we conclude, this might seem a bit bizarre, but this is naught. The right hand side is naught, hence if you multiply by any um, real number, let's call it lambda, you've got naught equals lambda times naught, which is um, uh, true. If you apply the same logic to a bullet of light travelling in the opposite direction, it should be no surprise that your negatives change to positives. And I'm just going to stick a different real number here. Already we can see something very profound. Um, one famous scientist whose name I've forgotten <laughs> once said, very unfairly, Special relativity is a trivial application of linear algebra. And I think that's a bit unfair, but having said that, uh, the underlying fabric of special relativity is linear algebra. And before we go any further, we see here, you know, we're asking about how to transform between S's description of this event, which is actually a set of events, which is the light uh, bullet moving through space, and S prime's description of that same set of events, we have equations already which relate those two quantities and we see that they have the form of linear equations. So this tells us before we go any further that the transformation that we seek between um, these two descriptions of the set of events associated with bullets of light moving uh, forward or backwards and they're just tracing out or scoping different points, x comma t or x prime comma t prime in space time, it's actually linear transformations. So that's already quite a profound result. To get to the Lorentz transformations, all we have to do is solve for lambda and mu. Now, you're better at algebra at the, not, than I am, so what I'm going to ask you to do is to form uh, the sum of 38 and 39, and also to form the difference of 38 and 39. Uh, after you do that, I want you to let a and B respectively equal a certain linear combination of lambda and mu, lambda plus or lambda minus mu. Now I'll skip some equations here, but what you'll end up with will be equations 42, A and B. But there's nothing surprising here, these are just still our linear transformations. And I want to isolate, you know, if we think of transforming from unprimed to primed, I want to shove all the prime quantities on one side and the unprimed ones on the other. You could write this, by the way, as a matrix acting on a vector if you wanted to. Before I go on, by the way, um, I've just mentioned the profound connection or profound role that linear algebra plays in special relativity. I'll mention an even more profound connection, that uh, you've met li many linear differential equations in both, um, prim actually primarily in a quantum course, um, but to, to, to a large extent also in this course, you can set up a, uh, we do set up a correspondence between the two. You can actually map the theory of linear differential equations onto linear algebra concepts. Uh, so these things are, are, are profoundly connected. Uh, and we will um, explore that connection to some extent in this course, and to a large extent it's, ex it's explored in upper level quantum courses. But I digress. We have our proto Lorentz transformations that we need to, um, to complete the argument, we, we need to work out what A and B are. So let's begin by supposing that we're sitting. So here's S and S prime in standard configuration. And let's suppose that we're sitting at the origin of the S prime. So that's you, right? Um, sitting at the origin of the S prime axis. 
according to you, uh, x prime will be naught because you're at the origin of the primed um, coordinate system. So for this special case, for an inertial observer, you're an observer at rest in an inertial frame, I would call you an inertial observer, looking at the world, x prime is naught. So what does equation 42a look like? Well, if x prime is naught, you'll get naught equals ax minus bct. In other words, uh, ax equals bct. Now what I'm about to do is trivial from a mathematical perspective, but a beautifully cunning trick um, due to Einstein. So this is true if x prime equals naught. Fair enough. Now we can rearrange this to the following. Uh, x on t equals bc on a. And x on t is just v, the relative velocity of the frames. So I look at this expression, v equals bc on a, and sure, I've obtained it under a certain condition, x prime equals naught, but, and here's Einstein's argument, this is a relationship amongst constants. b is constant, c is constant, a is constant, v is constant. If it's a relationship amongst constants, it must be true in general. Now, when I first heard that argument, I said, no, nah, don't believe that. Um, th th think it through. You know, C, yes, it's a constant. V is a constant by construction. Why are A and B constants? Have a think about that. My hint is to use symmetry. With that uh, cryptic comment, this is a relationship among con constants and hence must be true uh, for any inertial observer. Now, what this lets you do is, is um, uh, eliminate uh, B. So you can use this expression here to eliminate B. And in particular, you can eliminate B from equations 42, equations 42A and B. And what you'll get is 46A and B. So this is good. We want to work out what A and B are. We've eliminated B. Uh, all we need to do is to work out this mysterious A in these linear transformations, which will ultimately become the Lorentz transformations. So here we go. Um, we need to work out what A is. And to work out A, we have a, another nice piece of Einsteinian type logic. Again, we consider our pair of frames. So I'm just going to sketch as a little cartoon what we're about to do, and then I'll work it through in detail. Here's frames S and S prime. And I could, if I wanted to, take a little ruler, a one meter ruler. Now what do I mean by one meter ruler? What I mean is I get a ruler, I'm in some inertial frame, I measure this position, I measure this position that's stationary, uh, and I measure the distance between them using Pythagoras' formula. Uh, I've got a stationary ruler, its uh, length um, uh, is going to be one metre. I'll ultimately use the term rest length, we'll find that flying rulers get ch um, change length, so this is the rest length, the length the ruler has when it's stationary. I do that experiment and I could say what's the length of this ruler as measured by an observer stuck to S, stationary with respect to S. That would be some length. Alternatively, we could have this same pair of frames and stick the ruler on the other frame. Now there's a symmetry here. The claim is because there's no privileged frame of reference and there's no preferred direction in space, uh, the length that this inertial observer ascribes to this flying ruler will be the same. So the length that um, observer A uh, uh, ascribes to flying ruler here will be the same as the length that B uh, ascribes to fl flying ruler S. Remember, remember that B will say that um, they're actually stationary uh, and the ruler's actually flying this way. There is no privileged frame of reference, right? You need to expunge that from your implicit assumptions. We're about to use um, this observation. A says that the length of this ruler 
is a certain amount, B says the length of this ruler is a certain amount, they're going to be the same. We're going to use this uh, statement to deduce A and arrive at our Lorentz transformations. So let's begin by having the observer S uh, stationary with respect to um, frame S prime. Often we just speak of this observer as observer S, inertial observer S. And uh, what she's going to do is to uh, look at this ruler here, which is attached to frame S prime, and ask what its length is. This will be the X and X prime axes, respectively. Fair enough. Um, this uh, observer attached to S is going to take um, a measurement of the length of this ruler at some instant of her time. And her time is t, and that instant of time is going to be t equals naught. So if we set t equals naught in equation 46a, we'll get uh, x prime equals ax if t equals naught. Now, when this inertial observer is measuring the length of a ruler, this is a, this is a flying ruler, right? As far as S is concerned, this ruler is flying relative to her. So if I have a stationary ruler, I can measure this position, measure this position, do Pythagoras to see them. If it's all in the z direction, I just subtract the two numbers and I'll get the length. But I need to be a bit more careful if I'm looking at a flying ruler. I don't have the luxury of measuring the two ends at different um, values of my time. I must measure them simultaneously because if I measure them at different times, I'll get the wrong length. Here's a flying ruler. I measure its position, wait a bit, have a cup of coffee, measure this position, I'll get the wrong length. If there's a flying ruler, um, now we have to imagine a flying ruler going past me, I'll need to measure the, the two ends simultaneously according to my time. Uh, this is this uh, t equals naught. So um, S is a careful physicist and is measuring both ends of the moving ruler at exactly the same time t equals naught. And so she'll have one equation which is x1 prime equals ax1, that's for one end of the ruler, and then x2 prime equals ax2 for the other end of the ruler. Uh, she'll subtract them, and x2 prime minus x1 prime, let's call that delta x prime. x2 minus x1, let's call that delta x, uh, and here's our a. So I'll call this the difference form of equation 44, which is now equation 48, under the same conditions that t prime equals naught. Fair enough. Now, just to make things easier, let's make this a unit um, length ruler. So delta x prime, the length ascribed to the ruler in s prime is going to be 1. So if this thing is 1, we learn that delta x equals 1 on a. I'll put a box on this, not because it's a particularly important result, but because I'm going to use it later. So this is the length that uh, physicist S ascribes to uh, this flying ruler, which is rigidly attached parallel to the S, x prime axis of S prime. I want to now apply uh, similar logic with um, ruler and observer interchange. So S, S prime, ruler, and observer interchanged. Fair enough. Um, and I want to ask what length does um, a second physicist ascribe to, to this flying rule? And again, S prime can be moving to the right relative to S. Um, but as far as S prime is concerned, S is moving in the opposite direction, equal and opposite um, velocity. OK. Uh, I need a couple of steps, which I'll leave to you. Uh, the first of which is to eliminate t from equations 46. By the way, just as a as a cryptic uh, as a question, which I'll invite you to discuss later. How the hell do you think of doing this, right? It's one thing for me to you know, say do this, do this, and here this thing falls out cleanly, but how do you actually? Um, uh, deduce that this is a good next step to make? What if you tried something different? 
Now, in the process of discovery, when you're discovering new physics formulas, um, or physics results, or mathematical results, um, there's often a lot of trial and error. Sometimes it's only clear in retrospect why you chose a particular starting point. But I'd invite you to stare at this calculation because it's, it's not going to be taxing your mathematical brains. You could have done this kind of linear algebra in high school. But I want you to stare at this and say, why is this an obvious next step towards um, something profound, which is getting um, the Lorentz transformations? And the higher you go in physics, the less obvious it often is, um, except in retrospect. And if you're not sure, just try something. If it doesn't work, try something else and keep trying things until they work. This is trial and error, classic technique for doing research. But I'm babbling. Um, we eliminate T from equations 46. I'll leave the algebra to you. Uh, what you'll get will be equation 50, T prime V on A. And we're staring at this A because we want to know what A is. Now, this observer in S prime is taking a snapshot at an instant of her time. Uh, so she's going to take a snapshot of, of the flying ruler at t prime equals naught. So we can set t prime equals naught in equation 50, which scrubs this term, and we get equation 51. Yep. We can write down a difference form of this equation, just like we did before, but let me be a bit quicker. You basically just stick deltas in front of the coordinates. You can do that because you have linear transformations. Just stick deltas in front of the coordinates. So this is now the difference form uh, of equation 51. And then we do a similar trick to what we did before. We say that delta x prime, sorry, the length of this ruler will be delta x according to s and delta x prime according to s prime. But delta x, um, the observer s, says that this is a stationary unit length ruler. And so therefore, delta x is 1. So we can replace this with 1. We cross it off. And we now get, um, uh, in essence, equation 53. But delta x prime equals a, etc. And this is the point at which we can invoke the relativity principle. Yep. I was about to say that I'm getting confused by my colours of chalk, but um, we'll actually learn later that colour is relative as well. All right. So in our, in our frame, this is red um, or pink. All right. Um, the relativity principle says that in the first experiment, this physicist describes a certain length to this flying ruler, in the second ex which we call delta x. In the second experiment, the same physicist applies um, the uh, in lost for words. Uh, the same physicist ascribes the length delta x prime to this flying ruler. The relativity principle says these things; these lengths must be the same. Delta x equals delta x prime. Hence, one on a equals this. Yep. So 1 on a equals a into 1 minus v squared on c squared. Fantastic. We can now solve for a. And what you'll get will be that um, a is this very famous fact that we've already seen uh, before. Now, just as a pointless change of notation, uh, I'm going to call this gamma. Uh, this is the so-called Lorentz factor. Uh, as defined in equation 55c. It's the Lorentz factor. So with this uh, Lorentz factor, we can now write down our linear transformations. We can write down um, x prime equals gamma into x minus vt, uh, um, uh, ct prime equals gamma, etc. So what we're going to get is the famous Lorentz transformations. By the way, they're called the Lorentz transformations because the Lorentz worked them out before Einstein as a way of making, um, uh, uh, basically as a way of, of um, uh, sorry, story for another day. Um, but this was derived by uh, Lorentz before Einstein using flawed reasoning that led to the right answer. 
So t equals gamma into t minus vx on c squared. This is, um, in essence, equation 46b with our expression for a, a replaced with gamma, divided through by c. x prime uh, equals gamma into x minus vt. This is um, essentially equation 46a. Now, our other coordinates just came along for the ride. y prime equals y, z prime equals z. So these are our famous uh, Lorentz transformations which play a pivotal role in special relativity. So they get a big thick box, very, very important. Now I'm going to show you something sneaky. Suppose I said, fair enough, you're clever, Mr Einstein, uh, you've just worked out how to go from um, S's description of the event, the x, y, z, t, You've just shown me via the Lorentz transformations how to go from x, y, z, t, shove it in the right side of these expressions, and you'll get x prime, y prime, z prime, uh, t prime. But what about the inverse transformation? What about the inverse Lorentz transformations? Now I'm going to show you a shifty trick. Let's look at frames s and s prime in standard configuration. Now I'm not going to prove what I'm about to say because I leave this as an exercise, exercise 12. It's what's called a V-reversal. And I mentioned earlier about the importance of symmetry. And I've already challenged you a couple of times to make use of symmetries to help you calculate things more swiftly and more elegantly. I'm about to do this now. I'm about to um, in, uh, teach you a symmetry that will let you write down the corresponding inverse transformations on inspection. So here's the claim, this thing called a V reversal. So the claims as follows. Here you have frames S and S prime. Suppose that you do two things. Number one, you interchange primed and unprimed quantities. And two, you replace V with minus V. That's it, two step process. You interchange primed and unprimed quantities and you replace V with minus V. The claim is that this diagram will be unchanged. And um, this diagram will be unchanged. Yep. In fact, let me do it because it's so important. So here's S and S prime. Let me do two things. I'm going to interchange primed and unprimed quantities. So the S becomes an S prime. S becomes S. And I'm going to replace V with, with its negative. So I've I've done those two processes. I've now got S prime moving this way uh, relative to uh, S. Yep. I've interchanged prime. Sorry, <laughs> screwed up. I've interchanged prime with unprimed quantities, uh, and this vector, velocity vector, has been reversed. Well, this just has S moving to the left relative to S prime, which is no different to this. Right? There's no absolute frame of rest. S prime moving to the right with velocity v relative to s is exactly the same as s moving to the left um, relative to a stationary s prime. So the point is, and here's the, here's the key result, any valid relativistic transformation, including this one, um, can be changed into another valid relativistic transformation via a two-step process, interchange primed with unprimed quantities, and replace v with minus v. So let's do it. Where there's primes, you get rid of them. Where there's no primes, you put them in. t becomes t prime, x becomes x prime, y and z become y prime and z prime. Similarly for x here and the t here. They had no primes, they now get primes. V becomes minus V, so this is now plus V, X prime on C squared. This is plus VT. Now gamma um, is a function of V squared. Gamma doesn't care if you make V negative. So what I've just done is to interchange primed and unprimed quantities, replace V with minus V, and I take uh, some valid relativistic transformation, which in this case is the forward Lorentz transformations, and I get on inspection the inverse Lorentz transformation. So this is um, a, a very, very cute trick that can be applied to any valid relativistic transformation, no matter how complicated. 
So we have our uh, Lorentz transformations and our inverse uh, Lorentz transformations, equations 56 and 57 respectively. So we now know how to transform uh, events, uh, clicks, dots in space-time from frame to frame. Now, in order to do relativistic physics, you want to be able to do two things. Um, you want to be able to transform all quantities, uh, velocities, energies, uh, momenta, times, uh, lengths, uh, electric fields, uh, magnetic fields, uh, quantum mechanical wave functions and so on. You want to be able to express um, uh, your various, you want to be able to transform quantities that are more complicated than um, also accelerations. Quantities that are more uh, complicated than uh, events, we'll get to, to um, uh, all of these later, except for we won't do any, any relativistic quantum mechanics. Secondly, if the laws of physics are the same in all inertial frames, then you'll want to write, be able to write down equations that have uh, a form which is identical in all frames. Now that's going to in invoke the natural use of so-called tensors. Um, we're going to tensorialize special relativity for two reasons. One, two related reasons. The first is um, tensorial equations have the property of being the same in form uh, in all um, uh, relevant frames of reference, in this case in all inertial frames. Secondly, uh, I teach this course in a way that makes as smooth as possible as transition into general relativity. Um, a tensorial formulation, you can, you can get away with studying relativity to quite a deep level without introducing tensors. Um, you can't get away with, um, you can't run away from tensors with general relativity. So um, a tensorial formulation of special relativity, while not strictly speaking essential, A brings out some very, very deep simplicities and deep features. Uh, B it makes a very smooth transition into general relativity. Um, I want to move on to section 10 now, which is some properties of the Lorentz transformations. And I'm not going to get to the end of this section. So we want to study some properties. We'll begin it today. Uh, and finish it next time. So the first property we want to consider is the relativity of simultaneity. You know, in a world where there's no absolute frame of rest, one is intimately concerned with how to transform from a description of the physical world from one non-privileged -pri frame to another. Here we learn, or have learned, how to transform events. In general, uh, things are going to change. The descriptors, in this case x, y, z, t, is going to change from frame to frame. There are some absolutes. C, for example, is an absolute. It's uh, a number, a quantity on which all inertial observers agree. But um, uh, in general, things are going to change. Question, um, is the concept of simultaneous events uh, an absolute concept or a relative one? As the title of this section suggests, uh, the concept of uh, simultaneous events, which refers to two events occurring at the same time, uh, that concept of simultaneity is relative. In other words, two events that are deemed simultaneous in one frame, um, uh, one inertial frame, are not necessarily uh, simultaneous in a second inertial reference frame. I failed the IQ test because I need this board to do this. I can't write down low and I can't just shove that one up because that one's in the front. All right. So what I want to do is to demonstrate uh, that the relativity of simultaneity, the idea that um, uh, the concept of simultaneous events is not um, absolute, is frame dependent, is a logical consequence of the Lorentz transformations. So let's consider two clicks, you know, two events, an x1 uh, t1 and an x2 t2. These are inertial reference frames in standard configuration. The absence of primes means this is s. So this is a pair of events um, and I want x1 to not equal x2. Two clicks occur at T1 and T2, positions X1 and X2 according to S. Now we know how to transform our events. We just run it through the Lorentz transformations um, and you'll get the corresponding primed quantities. X1, T1 will become X1 prime, uh, T1 prime. X2, T2 will become X2 prime, uh, 
T2 prime, and you can write these things out explicitly. And it's done in equations 57, gamma into x1 minus v t1, uh, t1 minus v x1 on, on c squared. Uh, similarly for the second, with 1 replacing the 2. So let's now set t2 equal to t1. So we're setting t2 equal to t1. And we ask the question, so let t2 equal t1, and we can give this a name, we can call it um, t. And if you ask the question, um, what is t2 prime minus t1 prime? Fair enough. What's t2 prime minus t1 prime? The, the events are simultaneous according to the unprimed frame. This difference of times is naught. The events are simultaneous according to s. But s prime says x1 prime, x2 prime, t1 prime, t2 prime. What's the difference of those times? And when you do the algebra, you get something that's not naught. That's disturbing. This says that two events which are simultaneous in one, one inertial reference frame are not simultaneous in the other inertial reference frame. And that is a profound violation of common sense. That's a profound um, disproof of, a, a, as a consequence of the, uh, of the Lorentz transformations, it's a profound disproof of this idea of absolute true and mathematical time. So two events that are simultaneous um, in one frame are not necessarily simultaneous in the other. I've mentioned a couple of times, by the way, that we have terrible, and that's what the mathematics tells us, two things. We have terrible intuition for the non-infinite nature of the speed of, of light. If you were to formally set c to infinity, the right side goes to naught and you get back your common sense, your, your flawed everyday common sense, um, that these two times are going to be the same. But the speed of light is large but not infinite. Uh, this right-hand side uh, is in fact non-zero. That's a bit clever. We've got the relativity of simultaneity, but just because you can calculate it doesn't mean that you understand it. What we're going to do in the beginning of the next class is to re-derive the concept of simult simultaneity being relative, not just by applying some trivial mathematics to equations 56, the Lorentz transformations, but rather uh, to understand this more deeply from a conceptual perspective, because this is an absolute violation of common sense, but the world of, of logic. Um, this is a logical consequence of the, Einstein, um, of the two Einstein axioms. Uh, which is absolute violation of common sense. But just like the lemon tree, um, uh, everyday common sense is not necessarily going to extrap extrapolate to quantities that um, uh, exist with values that are far beyond everyday experience. And the sp speed of light is certainly something we can't directly intuit. I'll stop there. Thank you.